is Gary Coleman, Senior Managing Director for Deloitte. And I actually am very delighted today to be here uh, and privileged to moderate today's panel on chasing the next big idea. So our objective today is to share bold ideas, big ideas, that can help redefine East Asian leadership. We'll be talking about things like smart cities, disruptive innovation, digital technologies, new business models, social collateral, collective consumption, and how all of these ideas can have a positive impact to business and society for East Asia and emerging nations within East Asia like Myanmar. So before I introduce the panel, I'd like to tee up kind of the challenge and the opportunities. It's no secret that East Asia has been fascinating. Five countries in East Asia region fall in the top 20 of the forum's global competitive index. East Asia, including Pacific for this fact, is on target to lower poverty rates from 50% in 1990 to less than 10% in 2015. And according to a Deloitte study, manufacturing competitiveness is shifting to Asia as nine of the top 15 most competitive countries will be in East Asia as predicted for 2018. All great, fascinating statistics. But there are challenges, many of which you heard in the last day and a half here. According to the World Bank Ease of Doing Business, many countries in East Asia rank low. They rank low due because it's difficult to start a business, high tax rates, poor infrastructure, lack of investor protection, lack of solutions for insolvency, enforcement of contracts, access to electricity and other important infrastructure. The World Bank puts private investment in infrastructure at less than 1% of GDP in ASEAN countries. That compares to 12% for the United States. And according to the Social Prog Progress Index, authored by Michael Porter of Harvard Business School, only two of the seven East Asian countries on the index were in the top 20. But when we look at things with the glass half full, these challenges create great opportunities. But to capitalize on those opportunities, we have to ask ourselves tough, complex questions, such as what investments are needed, smart infrastructure and innovation and technology. What can be done to ensure citizens are brought along in the growth and prosperity of this journey? And how does East Asia take place and play in world markets? To answer these questions, we need big, bold ideas from a variety of sources, including government, social entrepreneurship, private innovation, philanthropy, and business. So it is with my great pleasure to introduce our panelists that bring all of these sources together in one spot. I find that pretty amazing, and I hope you do too. Each of these panelists are tremendously gifted and experienced and accomplished. And if I told you about all of their accomplishments, we'd have no time for the panel. So I'm going to be brief in their introductions, and so please take that into account. First, we have Fazal Hassan Abed, founder and chairperson of BRAC. Joining us shortly will be the Right Honorable Tony Blair, who served as Prime Minister of the UK from 97 to 07. Ms. Hang Do, who is Journal Manager of iVivu.com, one of the leading online travel sites in Vietnam, and I can attest that it does exist because I went on your site this morning. <laughs> it's very lively, but it's in Vietnamese, but I did find a, a flag to go to English. We have Takanaka-san, who is the Director of Global Research Institute at Keio University in Japan, member of the World Economic Forum Foundation Board, and also on the Global Agenda Council for Japan. Ms. April Rini, 
is the Chief Strategy Officer of Collaborative Lab, a US-based consultancy that is focused on collaborative economy and sharing-based business models. And April is a young global leader here with the forum. We have Haider Assad, based in Singapore. He is the regional president, Southeast Asia, for ABB, a leader in power and alternative technologies. So the way this is going to work is that uh, we're going to go through a big idea session, one round. I'm going to collect some notes. We'll do another round with the panelists, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So I ask you to uh, take your notes, be lively. Let's ask good questions. The panelists I know have good answers. So um, I bet I'm going to start with you if you don't mind. I actually read a quote that you had, and I found it quite fascinating. It says, communities and nations develop only when everyone does their part. We cannot always wait for the government to provide all the essential services or for the private sector to create all the jobs. Somewhere there's a big idea for East Asia in that. Can you expand? Yes. Um, East Asia, of course, is a, not a homogeneous region. There are at least three high-income countries, Japan, Korea, and Singapore. And then there are uh, middle-income countries, China, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Philippines, and low-income countries, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos. So um, if you look at the high-income countries, what did they do very well? I thought that all these high-income countries, Japan, Korea, and Singapore, all have invested in education, high-quality education for their citizens, built high-quality universities. And if you look at the top 100 universities in the world, there will be Japan, Korea, and Singapore has the largest number in Asia. Uh, and, uh, and the middle-income countries, uh, China, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, doesn't have so many high-quality universities in the top 100. And I thought that uh, there, is a, there is a possibility of these countries not being able to provide or create high-quality universities where innovation and enterprise are, 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 are spearheaded. Unless we can do that, they will be trapped in middle-income countries, mid, as, as middle-income countries. And then low-income countries like Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, they need to in, also invest in education. And the smart infrastructure that we talk about mm -hmm. is really broad, uh, really the uh, broadband connectivity that will be needed to provide high quality e-education. So educational opportunities for all, if you want to create in our societies, it will have to be, have to take new kinds of smart uh, broadband connectivity and, and provide high quality education to its citizens. And it'll also build e equity in the society if you can provide quality education to all your citizens rather than only a small minority in the, at the top or people who can afford private education. So that's one big idea that I thought that, um, that these countries need in order to scale up the, themselves from low income to middle income and middle income to high income. So that's one idea. The other is there are lots of good ideas which needs to be scaled up. Uh, scaling up doesn't happen. Good ideas stay in, in small scale. So scaling up good ideas in societies is also another thing that has not taken place in many countries. We know many good ideas, but they're in small scale uh, pilot space that has not been um, uh, uh, scaled up properly. Um, the other thing that I was thinking was the role of universities. Uh, universities, uh, as I said, that the top, world's top universities are in these high-income countries like Singapore and Korea and Japan. 
But how do you build high quality universities where innovation and enterprise can be promoted and spearheaded? So that's, that's another, uh, another area that I think building quality universities and what it takes to build quality universities is also something that needs to be looked at. I, I remember I was getting an honorary degree from a Canadian university in 1994, and one of the people who are getting a degree from the university was a historian. And he looked at uh, 15th, 16th century European institutions. And I asked him, what did you find? And he said, I found only 20, 33 institutions still surviving from 16th century. So I said, what are they? He said, there are 29 of them are universities, mm. two churches, one parliament, and one business. So, so the, the 29 <laughs> universities are Oxford, Cambridge, what was the business? Bologna, Sobourne, <laughs> Heidelberg, and so on. Invest in that. So, 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 so I said that, um, you know, why, why don't universities survive and, and not other institutions? And he, he said, I can only speculate on it. I don't know exactly the reason why. The universities are, are self-governing institutions. Uh, they have always um, uh, sort of contributed to creating new leaders for societies. So even governments um, uh, provided support to them because the leaders came from these universities. And Mr. Blair comes from Oxford. <laughs> so, 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 so the leaders came from high quality universities. And high quality universities are important for, uh, for any society to try and spearhead right. new leadership education, uh, and, uh, and enterprise. So I would uh, confine myself to the, uh, not a new idea, but an idea which has been there and which has not been um, uh, taken up okay. that seriously by all. So I would say education, quality education for everybody, high quality universities in societies which uh, need leadership, innovation, and enterprise. Good, we, we'll, we'll follow up on that. Mr. Blair, um, I believe uh, you've been in Myanmar three times and this is your fourth, if, if my notes are correct. Visited many people and representatives here. Uh, very active in other emerging, developing economies. What's your big idea or, or introductory comment for Myanmar and or East Asia? Um, I think my, my reflection would be that the, the, the key thing today that makes the difference for a country is, is the quality of its government governance. Mm. And by that, I don't just mean whether the government's honest or not, or transparent or not, but the effectiveness of the government. I mean, I think the single toughest thing governments find today is getting the job done. You know, how do you get things delivered? How do you make sure that electricity, infrastructure, um, basic rule-based systems are put in place? How, how do you make sure that you, you can create for your citizens the sort of rudiments of essential educational and healthcare opportunities? And so the idea is that, that, that the quality of governance is the central distinguishing feature. And I would say when, when you're looking at, for example, South Korea, um, Japan and Singapore, I would put a, a education, obviously very important, but I would put rule of law also very important. I think that's a major, major factor that distinguishes countries that succeed today from countries that fail. And I think the other reflection which is linked to that is that the, the good news about this is that there are actually examples now from around the world. If you go back over the last half century or 60 years, there are examples of, from around the world of what works and what doesn't. And I think that the challenge for governments is to assemble right. those ideas and implement them. And it's the doing that's really hard. So, you know, when I first came to power in Downing Street, I remember thinking, you know, since I was prime minister, uh, if I sat in Downing Street and, you know, around the cabinet table and gave an instruction that something actually happened. Uh, this, was, this, was a, a, this, was, this became a sad disappointment to me when I realized this was not the case. And that actually there's a whole thing called execution, um, uh, not in the way sometimes meant, but they, actually <laughs> getting the job done that, that was an, an essential part of the whole thing. So that's, 
And I think the interesting thing is to focus in and around that and how we help governments do that. Because for here, I would say, look, of course you've got the, the, the political challenge around the democratic process, the various conflicts, and so on. But unless you can de start delivering on things like telecommunications infrastructure, electricity, roads, and so on, it's going to be hard for those democratic routes to be put down in a sustainable way. So that is my thought, and I okay. think there are great examples of the good and the bad out in this region, and we want to assemble the best practice from the good and put to the side the bad. Good. We're going to have a uh, follow-up on the how do, we, how do we actually do that. Um, Hong, I'm going to uh, go to you next for your big idea. And you have uh, really taken uh, technology and innovation uh, in Vietnam sort of to a new level. Not sure everybody's been able to catch up yet. Um, so I'd be interested in how many hits you have on your site. But uh, talk to us a little bit about your big ideas that relates to East Asia and if you choose uh, specific to Myanmar. Um, sure. Um Firstly, it's my incredible privilege to sit in on this panel. I'm part of the Global Shapers Program, and it is an initiative to bring the young boys to the table, and I hope the young boys count. Um, talking about technology, I would have to cite, a, a, I would think, a very proud example from Vietnam. Ten years ago, when you go to Vietnam, there's no internet, it's possibly nothing. But then after only 10 or 15 years, can you imagine, from a country of, I would, 70 million people. Now we have 35% internet penetration, and the mobile penetration rate is 120%. So everyone has an average more than one cell phone. That's an <laughs> incredible number. I think it's, it's a great initiative on the government side. I think the government has done a great job on this. It's a great job on a lot of the private businesses, uh, national champions like FPT Corporation or Viettel who have really bring the technology to the people. And what I mean here is that it does not only uh, create just an industry, a new sort of income revenue, but then also a platform for everyone to be equal. If you live in Vietnam, you would understand quite well what I mean. It's the inf uh, information technology, it's the education access, it's the, it's the knowledge. Knowledge is power. And on that platform, we can build so many other things. So I'm, I, um, after getting back from business school, I'm now in the travel industry. And I kid you not, in travel, people, at least in Vietnam, um, the public officials are not always up to date in online, while all other travelers around the world use 90% use internet to plan their online travel. So we want to use online, we want to use information technology as the gateway to open up our country to attract tourists. And uh, it's also a great way to um, uh, create jobs. I think we uh, contribute about 5% of our GDP uh, and also 5% of uh, employment. We want to increase this number. So just by that sheer number, I think the potential is great. And then when I looked at uh, the Myanmar uh, numbers uh, from Myanmar, I was very surprised in the first place. I could not imagine a country now that has less than 5% of like, internet and mobile penetration. And then I talked to uh, my colleagues and other participants here, and they realized that the problem is you know, the infrastructure. They need to set up the whole in energy system first, and then it's the ICT infrastructure. And I think you know, if it takes Vietnam 10 to 15 years, to establish that, I, I would say that my, Myanmar, learning from all the lessons around the world, hopefully it would just take five years. And by this time, you know, if I, in five years when we come back, we'll see everyone equipped with a mobile phone, get access to information, have you know, new ways to um, build the economy. There are new businesses popping up, and that's what we want. You're going to build a travel site in uh, Myanmar? We would love to. <laughs> everyone loves to go to Myanmar now. <laughs> um, I, uh, we um, uh, ran into each other yesterday in the hallway, and we had a chance to, uh, uh, you introduced the topic of urbanization to me. You had some fascinating thoughts around that. Uh, maybe share a little bit of that, and, and if your big idea happens to be around that, that could be fine. If it's uh, tangential to that, that's okay, too. Thanks, Gary. I think I probably need to apologize to the audience as well, because they all came here expecting to hear totally new ideas, and what we're hearing about is education, effective government, the internet, and mine is also a fairly mundane one, which will be smart cities. But I think the theme behind it is you don't need new ideas, we just need to effectively yeah. implement the ones that we know about. 
Um, for me, it was urbanization that, that got me thinking because you know, we all saw the statistic a couple of years ago that more than 50% of people now live in cities. When I dug into that, it's actually three and a half billion people that are now living in cities. And that's equivalent to the entire world population in 1968. So you know, that's when I was 10 years old. And I, you, know, you thought the world is a huge place and billions of people. And now all that amount of population are living in cities. And between now and 2050, another three and a half billion will be added to that number in cities. And 90% of that will be in the developing world. So now what's so special about that? I mean, cities today, they occupy about 3% of the land mass, mm. but they take up 60% of energy, and they, produced, they produce around about 70% of global emissions of um, pollution. So if you're going to add another 3 billion people to the ones that are already there, we're going to have to do something different. And you know, there, therein comes the concept of the mm. smart cities, where you're talking about you know, how we produce energy, how we distribute energy, how buildings are made intelligent. By the way, I always wondered why buildings are intelligent, but cities are smart. You know? <laughs> I guess we'll find it's out. It's the so, consultants. They have to come up with new words. So, you know. right. <laughs> so intelligent buildings, how we move water around, how we move waste around. Um, and all that has to be thought of. And in the next 20 years, because of what's happening in the cities, people reckon that about $40 trillion will be spent on mm. urbanization, on cities, on infrastructure in cities. And how we, how we build that infrastructure will, will tell a lot about whether we increase the way that we're attacking the planet or whether we try and improve it. And smart cities, of course, will go towards improving it. Um, now then I thought, maybe let's try and talk about some examples. So if you look at Stockholm, you've got the Royal, sea, you've got the Royal Port area in Stockholm. And they're building a smart grid around that, which will be um, powered by renewable sources as well as traditional sources. Um, that power will go to homes, factories, um, and, and the port, as well as ships in the port. And I'll come back to why ships in the port in a little while. But they hope that in the next 20 years, that whole entire grid in that area will be powered by renewable sources, including solar and wind. Now, why ships in the port? A ship, when it comes to port, tends to run its diesels to generate electricity. Mm. And normally, ships stay in a port for about 10 hours. During those 10 hours, a ship will produce about 20 tons of CO2. So now you suddenly think, think of all the thousands of ports. And I live in Singapore, the world's biggest port. And think of the thousands of ships that are coming there, running their diesels, producing CO2. stuff. And, if, and a simple idea is just plug them into the grid instead of letting them run their diesels if they need electricity. And if you can plug them into a grid with renewable sources, even better. So that's what uh, Copenhagen did. It was one of the first, first countries to do that. But there are also now pilots in Shanghai and in Hong Kong to try and do the same thing. And we're trying to persuade the Singapore government to do the same thing in Singapore as well. So smart, ship, you know, smart ways to power ships and ports. Um, if you think about buildings, intelligent buildings, um, think of the amount of light that's wasted in a building when no one's there. Um, so a lot of buildings now have sensors in there. They automatically turn the lights off when, they, when people are not there. A good example is... Uh, the library, National Library in Singapore. What they do is they have the light sensors even better tuned, and they adjust the light according to the amount of sunlight that's filtering in. And if you can build a building which uses natural sunlight and then adjust the internal lighting, what they've been able to do with that is the energy consumption of the, um, the National Library in Singapore is something like 120, no, 102 kilowatt hours per year. And you compare that to the Singapore average of 220. So they've halved the energy use just by intelligent control, intelligent use of, of lighting. Now, if you think of the amount that goes into heating or cooling, you can also have buildings that actually heat or cool themselves, or preheat or pre-cool at times when energy is freely available. So why not cool a building more at night in Singapore when there's mm -hmm. cheaper energy available and allow that through good insulation to cool for much of the day? Um, then, of course, transport. Um, Everyone talks about electric cars. You know, the average family car will produce six tons of CO2 in a year. Um, and if we can have electric cars and try and power ag again with renewable energy, and I keep harping on about renewable right. energy because I think, you know, especially in this part of the world, just look at the sun, right? There's enough solar energy that falls on the earth in one day to power the earth for one year. So in a year, we get 5,000 times the amount of solar energy that the Earth produces in one year. Now, if we, could, well, if we could efficiently harness that, 
and coming back to electric vehicles, power our vehicles through that, that's, that's a good thing. But then if you think about six billion people living in cities, you don't want them all to drive around even electric cars, right? So we just done a, uh, done a pilot in um, Geneva on electric buses. And these electric buses pull into a bus stop where, with our technology, a robotic arm comes on immediately, within one second of a bus pulling in, hooks it up to a charger, an ultra-fast charger, that charges that bus in 15 seconds. Right? And that 15 seconds is long enough for you know, bus stops, normally 15 seconds, people get in and get off. And at the end of the route, it goes into another place where it's charged for three to four minutes. And that's enough to keep that bus going all day on charging. So if we can fill a city yeah. with um, electric buses, you not only have do away with a lot of pollution, but you also do away with a lot of those overhead lines that look pretty ugly as well. That's right. Um, so, you know, I think three and a half people, three and a half billion people living in cities, another three billion to come. We've got to make those cities smart. Otherwise, we're going to go the wrong way. Okay. We're going to come back to, I, got, I wrote down a couple of notes. We'll come back to that. April, uh, you and I ran into each other yesterday. I think we were both trying to find a quiet spot, and uh, we ended up running each other, and I don't think we got our quiet work done that we had intended. But uh, your conversation with me uh, was fascinating. Uh, it deals also with the work that you do with Collabor Labs, but uh, you talked to me about new global business models that are coming, um, and you talked about collaborative consumption. Um, share with us your, your idea here to kick things off. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here with all of you today. And my idea might be um, new to some people, but it actually draws on a lot of the threads that we've heard already. Uh, might be quite new to some of the people in the audience. My next big idea, actually, though, is an ancient idea. <laughs> it centers on one of the oldest behaviors known to mankind, sharing. But that ancient behavior, now amplified through technology, has turned into a growing global movement called collaborative consumption or the sharing economy. Now, collaborative consumption is defined as the reinvention of traditional market-oriented behaviors, such as renting, lending, swapping, gifting, bartering, through technology on a, in ways and on a scale never before possible. And in the process of doing this, we're reshaping business we're rebuilding communities, and we're changing the way that we think about the assets that are all around us. We're discovering that many times access to a given, access, to a given asset is preferable to ownership. We're creating markets for things that never had markets before. And in the process, we're also creating local jobs and livelihoods, promoting local economic investment and sustainable growth. So pause for a minute and consider the assets that are around you and how often they sit idle. On average, a car sits idle 22 hours a day. A pow take an appliance like a power drill, which costs maybe $100. A power drill, on average, is used 14 minutes in its entire life. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty expensive hole in the wall. Um, <laughs> Office space, at any given point in time, 70% of office space sits empty. Now, collaborative consumption starts to make these assets visible and exchangeable, and sometimes for money, oftentimes for money, uh, but not necessarily. We can think about value creation in which money is not necessarily changing hands, but wealth and value are being created. Um, and in the process, we're also reconnecting people to one another, providing very meaningful local level benefits and income generation. So I like to think about it, sharing assets, net net, it is more economically efficient to share assets rather than own them outright. It's more environmentally sustainable because we're using, producing and consuming resources more efficiently and it contributes to community building and social capital. Now, if you like any one of those things, you should like collaborative consumption, the sharing economy. If you happen, like me, to like all three, then this is really a trifecta. 
So pause for just a minute and I'll, I'll give you a few examples of the kinds of collaborative consumption models and systems that are out there. One is really what's called a redistribution market in which we're thinking about how do we get assets from where they no longer need to be to someone or somewhere where they can be useful. So an easy example is clothing. For those of you who have children in the room, kids outgrow clothing quickly. Um, outgrown, how do we get those to, to children that are now you know, in that age cohort or that size cohort? There are companies that are being built. You know, ThreadUp is one in the United States, which is where I'm based, where you'll never have to buy clothes for your kids again. And they'll actually get new clothes every month or every three months. Uh, another example is called product service systems. And that's where we're basically building, and again, this is through technology platforms, uh, access to, to services. To, um, you're accessing the services to, to, have a, to get to the product as opposed to owning the product outright. And there we can think about a variety of car sharing, bike sharing programs where you're accessing the, the, the product and paying for it only for that period of time that you need it. And third is what's called collaborative lifestyles. And this is where we're really talking about how do we share more intangible assets around us, such as time, skills, and experiences. So um, if we think about each of these models, you know, what are we doing? We're efficiently connecting people to one another. We're helping to build trust between strangers. We're unleashing the idling capacity in all of these assets. And we're redefining what wealth and value creation mean in today's new economy. So that's a global snapshot of what collaborative consumption is. And if we turn to the East Asia context, um, overall, it's relatively nascent here. But I think we're sitting on a huge opportunity and a really ripe moment in time. So um, there's one notable exception in the region, and that is actually Seoul, South Korea. Now, Seoul is probably the premier collaborative consumption city in the world. The government has self-proclaimed itself, self-proclaimed uh, as a sharing city. It's passed legislation to have a multi-pronged implementation plan that includes investment, it includes new public-private partnerships, and it includes supporting the work of collaborative consumption entrepreneurs. Now, that's Singapore, but we all, sorry, that's Seoul, South Korea, but we also do have activity in Singapore, in Japan, but also places like the Philippines and Vietnam. Much smaller, but I think we're just beginning. And I'll just end by saying, I think that one of the areas where we see an enormous amount of collaborative consumption activity already is tourism. And that we're talking about companies like Airbnb, for those of you who have heard of that. But in the case of Korea, they have Airbnb, they also have a company called Kozazu, which is in the Korean language, owned and run by Koreans, and really allows for a different type of local experience. So it's, an, it's a homestay, or you can stay in a temple, and you can meet local entrepreneurs that are also your guides, et cetera, et cetera. And you're paying for this, but this is really leading to a virtuous cycle of jobs creation, local economic investment, um, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And even here in, um, in Myanmar, I think there's an enormous opportunity to look at models like that and help those um, integrate those into the tourism agenda and strategy for this country moving forward. So look forward to discussing further. April, you may have called this uh, an ancient idea, but uh, maybe six months ago, The Economist, my favorite mm -hmm. magazine, had a special feature, I'm sure you read it, on the sharing economy. And that was the first time it, I, that, that I was exposed to that. So I've got some questions for you coming back. Great. Okay. Uh, Takanaka-san, um, you've been very active in, in J Japanese government and, and, and private sector. Um, I believe you oversaw the privatization involved in the, the postal services. So uh, in this introductory remarks, do you have a, an idea that for East Asia that you would like to share? Well, in my understanding, Japan, we, saw, we also have already that kind of uh, share custom. Uh, I'd like you next time to raise the case of uh, Japanese cities. O almost all cities besides Tokyo, maybe. <laughs> Tokyo is very special, but anyway, <laughs> we have a, a strong sense of share. But anyway, I am asked to raise some big idea. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> a mediocre idea with you. <laughs> well, honestly, I am a little bit uh, hesitant to raise big idea because my boss, uh, Mr. Koizumi, uh, he has a very good relation with. Uh, 
uh, Prime Minister Blair at that time, he often told me there is no magic stick in the policy making. There is no magic way in management. Very steady effort is needed. Uh, however, today I dare to raise one idea uh, based upon your request. Okay. Okay? That is uh, maybe, this is not very new idea, that's uh, uh, PPP, private, mm -hmm. uh, public private partnership. Uh, yesterday I came here and I attended some sessions here uh, in Asia Davos meeting and a lot of discussion was done mostly on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this, is, this country, Myanmar, your more infrastructure investment uh, is needed and also other countries in ASEAN also face the lack in infrastructure. However, also in Japan, Japan is a relatively high income country as you know, still we are suffering from lack in infrastructure. Two years ago, we had a very serious disaster uh, in the form of a tsunami and uh, mm -hmm. earthquake. So we need more infrastructure put to protect this kind of a disaster. Uh, on the other hand, in order to increase investment, as you can easily imagine, we need some source of investment, that's savings, savings. However, uh, well, Japan was uh, recognized as a country of high savings for a long time, but Japan's household saving rate is as low as that of the United States now, reflecting the aging of the society, aging of the demography. And similar problems are happening almost all countries in this region. Well, birth rate is now declining very rapidly in all Asian countries, and sooner or later, uh, Japan or all other Asian countries uh, will face a very similar problem of Japan, or uh, aging of the society. Under such circumstances, the lack of saving will create lack of investment. So how to conquer this kind of situation? This is the most serious problem that we will face in the coming 10 years or so, the 10 or 12 years or so. So, well, one way is to make use of the vitality of the private sector, our P PPP, that is PPP, private financial initiative, etc. Uh, also we use the term uh, concession. Well, road construction is needed, and also in this country, Myanmar, uh, the <coughs> infrastructure in Dawei, the city of Dawei, is causing, uh, drawing attention. I think this is a very strategic, very interesting project, but still, we need some source of savings. So we have to make use of the private sector's idea. And this is idea is applicable to internet and infrastructure also, even university system. Uh, well, in Korea, for example, they quite often use the term, uh, the concession. Well, infrastructure itself is owned by the state. However, the right to operate this infrastructure, it's, the right is sold to the private sector. Well, this will have uh, three good impacts. One is, well, uh, this will create a new business sector, business opportunity. The second, the quality of service, infrastructure service will be in increased, improved, because, uh, well, private sector has its own idea in the management. And thirdly, this will contribute a lot to the consolidation, fiscal consolidation. Well, now, in Japan, we often discuss the term abenomics, how to strengthen our uh, growth strategy. But in this regard, we are now uh, making uh, some kind of action plan for this uh, uh, concession. Of course, this is not a magic stick, magic mm -hmm. way. Uh, however, uh, making more use of this uh, method, private, public-private partnership in many fields, infrastructure, infrastructure of, internet and also university, et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, in this regard, the uh, British effort, we should study more. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, today we have a very good teacher on that. Uh, so I, anyway, I'd like to propose, if I'm asked, yes. the new type of very bold idea of PPP okay. in this okay. region. Yeah. So private-public partnerships, so maybe there, when we come to the audience, we can follow up. We are going to go uh, to the audience, but I do actually just have one follow-up question for, for Mr. Blair, because uh, we all said that uh, while these ideas can help, it's not exactly if they're new. They could be big and bold for this region, but uh, we're trying to learn from them. And, and you had indicated when you first stepped into office, you thought you could just go give some orders and things would happen. But uh, I think I have a president in my country who's experiencing some s similar <laughs> difficulties. 
Um, but uh, you, you, you made reference to, to how we can help. How can maybe the developed economies or people in this room, uh, how, can, how can people help the, go the governments and the societies in, in the emerging economies? Can you just take us a little bit further down that journey before we open it up to Q&A, please? Well, I think it's a great question, actually. And um, it's a real pleasure to be, to, be, to be on the panel. My reflection, li listening to everyone, is, is how many smart people and smart ideas there are um, <laughs> Outside government. <laughs> really. uh, um, you mean the smart people inside government as well? Well, right. no, I think that's part of it. I think, you know, one of the things is, that is very interesting to me today is, is that the, I think that governments to function <clears throat> are, are obviously require the types of things that I was talking about earlier, but they also require a willingness to go and engage and listen to new ideas that are found outside of government. And I think a lot of what is most creative now uh, is actually found outside of government. And the question is, how does, how does government manage to multiply that creativity and empower it and enable it and not actually get in the way of it, which is what <laughs> government's pretty good at doing? Um, you know, again, when I first came into office, because my party had always thought, the Labour Party had always thought that the bureaucracy in the civil service in the UK was a, con a conservative conspiracy. Um, and after a time, I realized it actually wasn't a conspiracy, either conservative or labor. It was actually a conspiracy for inertia. Um, and that was the chief characteristic of the system. And that systems are very good at, at stopping things happen, uh, things happening and stopping change. And, and I actually think, you know, whether developed or developing, there is a, a need to kind of use a lot of that creativity. And one of the things I say to, to developing country governments now is, look, <clears throat> you know, don't, because very often they say, when will we get a system like yours in the West? And I say, don't ask yourself that question. Ask yourself what you can learn from our experience, because there's good and bad. And if you're sensible about it, you can learn from the good and you can avoid the bad, because we've built up legacies that are often obstacles now mm. To, to improvement of the conditions of our people. So that's my thought about it, that, that I think, you know, one of the th things, because I look at this obviously from a, a sort of policymaker perspective, is how do we manage to take some of the types of ideas that have been talked to, which are you know, really interesting. How do, you, how do you manage to enable those to happen and make a difference in a country um, and get government actually moving with the grain of, of, <laughs> of where that change is going, rather than saying, well, look, that's the, we've done this this way, and we're always going to do it this way. It's so, you know, interesting for you guys to talk, but we're leave the serious way. business up to us. Whereas I actually think, you know, this is where the limits of government are very, very clear. And the challenge of government is, in fact, to, to take some of this energy and creativity and, and use it. Okay, wonderful. We're going to open up to uh, the audience, please. And so I think there are mics that are roving around. Please raise your hand. Um, we have one. Well, yeah, a lot of hands. Well, she, I saw hers first. I'll come back to you. Um, please identify yourself, if you don't mind, and then uh, ask your question. And if it's to a specific panelist, please do that. Thank you. Uh, we had great ideas. Uh, my name is Runa Khan. I'm from an organization. It's an NGO uh, dealing primarily with integrated de development in Bangladesh. Um, We've had great ideas here on the panel. Thank you for them. Uh, I want to know that when, you st when an organization, a person, or even a development agency like ours starts implementing an idea for tomorrow, by the time the idea comes, it's already day after tomorrow. So what is the mindset of any of these to be able to see, have that vision and take that leap of faith to jump into day after tomorrow instead of just going up to tomorrow. What would be the mindset of uh, the individual, the organization, or a social enterprise like ours? Would you like to try that? I, sure, I sure. have a couple of yeah, ideas I'm in sure that. You do. Um, <laughs> and actually, referring back to, to your comments around how do you get governments to come around, it, it, yeah, I think it all folds together. Um, and it really focuses for me on noting that the way things are today is not the way they're going to be tomorrow nor the next day. So let's, let's look at this as an organic, evolving process. 
And what that means, because one of the things that we encounter a lot in the sharing economy are policy and regulatory issues. We've built our legal and regulatory system on an ownership-based set of, set of assumptions. And when you apply these laws and policies, oftentimes it's not as though um, something is all of a sudden illegal, but they're clumsy and awkward, and what do we do? So they are what we've begun to do, and we do do some work with cities. Was, we were speaking earlier on shareable cities, and um, what does it mean to look at a city in this way or an enterprise? And for me, it ultimately boils down to having iterative an iterative process of evolution and building in feedback loops so that you're able to course correct if and when you need to, and you're also getting community level feedback. So not sure exactly what an initiative for you would be, but you know, we look at cases in which people are very, they, intellectually they understand the power of collaborative consumption, but they're quite afraid of what does it mean when I actually start sharing stuff, um, or how do I know how I can how do I know that I can trust others? And you build in all kinds of feedback loops, verification systems, and so that even if something were to go off the rails or you would, there would be a mismatch of expectations, it's pretty quickly that you can actually come back course correct and then leapfrog to the next step. And we see this play out within, within um, startup enterprises. We see this play out within communities that are trying to manage themselves. We definitely see this within governments as well. So I think it's more of a universal comment. Thank you very much. We had, I saw this question over here next, right? Hi, my name is Lila Jana, and I'm a new uh, young global leader. Oh. I run a, uh, a website called Sama Hope that allows anyone to fund a critical medical treatment for someone else on the other side of the world. Uh, so my question is for Mr. Abed. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, after we had passed civil rights legislation in the U.S. in the late 60s, he said, what does it profit a man to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he can't afford a hamburger? And uh, in the Asian region, we have 900 million people who live in extreme poverty. And a lot of the economic growth, I, I fear, will leave them out if we don't intentionally try to create jobs for them. So what are some of your ideas to create additional living wage jobs for the very poorest people, particularly in the wake of all of the gains we've made in civil rights and liberties? Good question. Well, um, the answer is a difficult one in the sense that uh, there are many many poor people in poor countries like Myanmar, Bangladesh, and so on. It's, it's uh, difficult uh, to find jobs for everybody, but that, that there have been attempts at create, creating opportunities for poor people to earn, in, earn in income and in livelihood through micro financial services. Microfinance we have tried out in Bangladesh for over the last th more than 30 years. But then, um, um, let me give you some examples of uh, where microfinance can also not help people. Um, we have, uh, I, we, we now have, uh, my organization has 8 million borrowers in my Bangladesh, and we give out $1.3 billion annually to, to in small loans to poor people. But then financial services helps quite a lot of people, and they can, they can earn a livelihood out of that. But then there are, um, obstacles to earning a livelihood in, in, in some areas, uh, remote areas, uh, in rural areas, and so on. So what happens, and I remember that when we, were th we had 3 million borrowers, we found that almost 10% of the borrowers were actually doing vegetable, vegetable gardening, um, produce vegetables to earn a livelihood. But then we found that the productivity of these enterprises were not very high in the sense that were lack of good quality seeds for uh, vegetables. So we went into a, it's, it's a, a social enterprise to, to try and develop uh, seed multiplication for vegetables. And once we created that business and we were able to supply high quality vegetable seeds, then of course their productivity went up and they had a living uh, livelihood improved. So the productivity improved and the, the livelihood improved. The same kind of thing happened with um, with uh, people who invested in livestock and they couldn't sell their milk in the village because there was no market for milk. So we collected those milk and processed them in. Uh, so we set up a dairy industry, which was again a social enterprise, and then uh, brought their milk from remote villages and processed them and made butter and, uh, uh, and pasteurized milk and marketed outside. So you not only need to um, 
do just one thing in terms of just microfinance is not going to solve all the problems, but also all the other problems that needs that are created, or the uh, uh, marketing and inputs that are needed that also needs to be provided. And then, of course, you can create jobs. In we try to <laughs> try to create jobs for people, because financial services alone can or can't create jobs. So what we did at, at one point is that we thought that uh, we could create maybe half a million jobs in silk, sericulture, silk, silk, worm reading and spinning and weaving and so on. So we planted 25 million mulberry trees in the roadside verges all over Bangladesh so that each woman could have 100 trees and that could collect all the leaves from these trees so to, silk, to feed to the silkworms and then have silk and uh, silk could become a business. So, so like that, we have tried many things to create jobs, to, to improve um, livelihoods for people. Through microfinance program was the platform, but then we tried many other things uh, in social enterprise creation in order to help poor people to come out of poverty and to create jobs for people. Very good question. Uh, right here, please. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, James Mwangi from Dalberg. We are a strategy firm working in developing countries around the world. I was intrigued by the idea of smart cities and think that the biggest opportunity for smart cities is likely to be in the emerging markets where you're seeing rapid growth and rapid urbanization. However, when policymakers in those countries typically have the opportunity to start from scratch, what you see in terms of the choices, in terms of design, construction, etc., is relatively energy intensive and not necessarily smart. And I look around and I don't see, for example, given the opportunity to start afresh with a new capital here, the application of some of the ideas that might be possible. How is it that we convince leaders in places where they're inclined to copy old models from elsewhere to really try and do things differently and be pioneering rather than lagging adopters of smart technologies? You want to start? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll. I'll try that. I, know, I think if, if people are making decisions that are suboptimal, then, then companies like us also have to share some of that responsibilities because we haven't done a good enough job selling what we're preaching. Um, and that means, you know, I think it's not just good enough me coming up here and spouting a few statistics. We need to work with the universities. We need to sponsor some research. We need to talk to the ministries. We need to arrange the seminars. And, and build up kind of groundswell of opinion that, that, that takes people in that direction, I think. So that, that's certainly one way to help it. Another way, I think, is also to try and help people understand that you know, part of transparency, for example, is when, when, when governments are building infrastructure, they have a very strict set of bidding criteria. And then the bids are open, and, and, and the governments tend to have to pick the lowest bidder. Right. Now, the way that those bids are structured, the lowest bidder is often not the one who's going to invest in, as part of a major project, building up local competence, um, working in a certain, certain standards of health and safety, transferring some technology, and leaving behind something as well. So again, that goes back into it, helping educate governments that don't just try and find infrastructure that's going to be the cheapest short term and give the business to the lowest bidder, but work, work in a more long term way. And I really think it's part of our responsibility as companies. It's not just good enough to do the R&D. We've actually got to go and create examples, create research, create data to help sell that message. Mr. Blair, James did kind of talk about how private enterprise has the design that could be potentially efficient and then the people that sign off on the designs that actually maybe do the approve the work tends to be from the government. So do you have something to add a little bit for just, James? Just very briefly. I mean, I, look, the, the problem for governments is often that they, you know, they're under huge pressure to get something done, right? And then um, what they often think, I, I, I believe now wrongly, but, but they do often think this, that the quickest way is just to do it in the in what can sometimes be the dirtiest way, actually. Um, and I, I, I think you're right. I think what we've got to do is, is to, 
we've actually got to build up a kind of intellectual capital around government as well, where people are able to see actually it would be possible to do it differently and more sustainably for, for the city and the country in the long term. And in some of the work we do with different governments around the, the world, um, particularly in, in Africa, we try and introduce some of those concepts, but it's very tough for the, you know, political <laughs> leaders in, in today's world, you know, the, the expectations of the people are very large and the gap between the expectation and how fast they can deliver the reality is, is often very severe. But, you know, there are ways of meeting it, actually, and that's, that's where the collaboration, as I say, from yeah. government to the outside is very important. Thank you, James. Good question. Another one? Right. A couple over here. Hello, my name is Tamara Abid. I work for BRAC in Bangladesh, and I'm a young global leader, 2010. My question is to any of the panelists here. I wonder what they think about the role of women as the next big idea, the increasing the participation of women in the economy and government as the next big idea for East Asia. Hong. <laughs> I think the role of women has always been a big idea. It doesn't have to be the next big idea. It's as ancient as you know, Ipo just said, it's, you know, we play a prominent role in our government. And as you look around, the participants around here, there are a lot of women faces. And also the Global Shapers program, the Young uh, Global Leaders programs, I see women and I think we are very confident. And you know we are smart too, and we take on challenges. So I think it's just we have to step up and take an active role. We don't sit back and wait for people to give this responsibility to us. No one can really define what exactly is the ideal role of women, right? We build that ourselves, we define it, and then we just take it on. We challenge the world. So I don't think it's a, never the next big idea. It's always a big idea. Right. And <laughs> Let's, let's go over on this side. I saw a couple of hands. Thank you very much for all the panelists. And my name is Sugiyama from Kokusai Kogo, Japan. And we are working for the infrastructure, infra, infrastructure investigating and the surveys. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear that there are a lot of you know, uh, discussions for the infra, infra, infrastructure in the future. But the, the almost same question for that lady. Uh, but the, I think that one of the most valuable and the precious infra, uh, hidden infra, infrastructure is the ladies' ability. And I'm quite mm. sure about that, that the, those two ladies in front of me is that quite smart and uh, must be overcome that the, the most difficulties <laughs> in, in the past. So could you give us any tips or something like that, not only for the business peoples, but for the government, that how to uh, make it possible uh, for the women to join that in the society or business in a good way. April, you wanna take a stab? Sure, um, happy to provide a couple of comments that also actually relate to your um, question. And uh, my background actually, I have spent the last decade plus in microfinance and in base of the economic pyramid marketplace creation. And I have transitioned into the sharing economy in recent years largely because I've started seeing very similar trends. Very different markets, different terminology, but the end result, again, is about around empowerment, around jobs creation, around enterprise. And kind of like I said, I didn't get into microfinance necessarily to promote women. Um, it's key to what I do and what I stand for, but for me it was always, um, I want to create jobs and small enterprise for everybody. And what you find is in the space of microfinance, most of the people that are unbanked in the world are women. So there's a natural synergy there. What I'm seeing as well, and I'll speak just from the, the perspective of the sharing economy and collaborative consumption, I mean, what we're helping people to do is not only reimagine your relationship to assets and where is wealth held and what does it mean to create value, but also in many cases, you see a lot of entrepreneurs re and, and users of collaborative consumption platforms redefining their relationship to time and priorities. And it all relates to sort of at the end of the day, what do you need for a thriving livelihood? And as we know, by and large, it's not that buy more stuff and you'll be happier. It's that we're, we're largely proving that paradigm wrong. But what we do find is that 
It's a new form of microenterprise, and a lot of the users and um, entrepreneurs and providers of collaborative consumption services are women. Again, mm -hmm. I'm not in this per se to promote women, but those especially that are looking for a work-life balance. Um, one example of a collaborative consumption or collaborative economy company is called Etsy. Some of you might have heard of Etsy. Um, it's an online portal where you can sell creative goods. They now have nearly a million shops selling on Etsy. The number of women and men that have been able to quit their jobs and actually raise a family at home and have a home-based business and earn income and all of that, the impact upon women is enormous. I do think that there is a very large call for what the government can do to promote that kind of activity because the hard part there, if you're an Etsy entrepreneur, you have a, a very interesting um, and highly successful work-life balance, but you don't necessarily have access to the same kind of benefits that you would have if you worked at a company. So there's a big question around what does this mean from public services? How do we make sure that we've still got a safety net in this space of microtasking and microentrepreneurship and so forth? So I think that's where, going back to your point around what does it mean to re reinvent, reimagine public-private partnerships, and also what does it mean to reimagine public services and civic innovation in a new economy where we're working differently, we're collaborating differently, we're creating value differently. I think it's just an enormous opportunity and I could talk about this all day. <laughs> um, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Uh, Takenaki-san, you want to comment? We have a short comment. Uh, well, Japan is not the right country to discuss this uh, gender gap issue because uh, <laughs> right. uh, World Economic Forum is issuing the report, yes. uh, the ranking. You, you are the Japan is uh, the <laughs> first or something <laughs> like that. But still, we have some kind of discussion on that. We now have a minister who is in charge of narrowing the gender gap, etc. And the Japanese government decided to have a kind of affirmative action. For example, you're giving some tax incentive to the companies which had some uh, favorable action for uh, narrowing gender gap. Of course, this is not very sound, I'm afraid. But still, the kind of, to some extent, this kind of affirmative action is needed. At the same time, we should recognize well, women's role is, and the men's role are both sides of the coin. So men, women's role should be uh, changed. This is indicating men's role will be, should be, changing, be changed. This is a very serious uh, discussion. We need more on the uh, male side. This is my context. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, this is my back over here, so let's go here. Thank you. Uh, Ken from the, the uh, local energy sector. The, uh, there's, uh, the, it's, uh, the, the question is mainly to Mr. Tony Blair. There is the, all the, always the, 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 the question of the, uh, this, the, the first mover advantage, and there's also the question of the uh, less mover advantage also, so where we can leapfrog. So considering the uh, mine country situation right now, we, are, we, we may be the one of the last to move. So can, uh, where do you see the, any leapfrog model? In, in terms of the, the energy or infrastructure or the whatever, so that we can inno innovatively employ this the model in terms of saving uh, uh, the social, economical, environmental costs, as we save the, as, uh, the environmental costs, and also the uh, making sure that uh, we can employ in the right timing. So how do you see that? Um, just very quickly, I mean, I. You see, I think that the, there is a lot of examples of best practice now. So if, if you're talking about things like energy and infrastructure, electricity and so on, um, there is a huge amount of intellectual capital and expertise, management expertise from outside the country that can be brought in. Um, by the way, countries often don't like to bring in people from outside because they think somehow that is, you know, that, that sort of reduces our sense of national pride. I mean, I really, you know, I think this is, a, this is a wrong-headed way of looking at it. And I think of somewhere like Singapore that started by importing intellectual capital and now exports it. So I think you get in the right actual expertise as to how to do it. You look at, for example, ways that you can do it in a way that's sustainable for the future on things like energy and, and the environment, where, again, there is best practice from, from around the world as to how you do it. And I, I emphasize this issue to do with the predictable set of rules so that people know when they're coming into a country, what can they, ex they expect? And what they expect is what they get. 
and they don't suddenly find everything changed further down the line. So, you know, this is, look, the great thing about the world today is that it is more connected than ever before. Uh, the ideas are out there. The capital is importable. The technology is available. But you've got to be sort of um, tough-minded enough to just access it. And, and if you do access it, you can make your country move. And, and by the way, I would then, on a whole set of other things, I mean, one of the things that fascinates me, for example, nowadays, is I think in the West, we would never create the education and healthcare systems that we have now if we were starting from today. For reasons of technology alone. Mm. You know, we just wouldn't do it like that. And so if I was looking at a country where, you know, you've got to get your, the rudiments going, I think you could do a massive amount um, to, 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 to leapfrog over um, the practices and, and the legacy systems in the West, which have built up these vast interests, as I say, that stand in the way of change. So I, I think there's, there's an enormous amount that, that can be done. I just make one final point, though, which is, which is this, because, you know, we were talking earlier about the young people and their impact on this situation. You guys have also got to get involved. I mean, one of the reasons why I love the, the concept, and I was discussing this with Klaus Schwab earlier about the, the global shapers and so on, is, you know, it's no, politics needs help, okay, in case you hadn't <laughs> noticed. Uh, um, and, you know, I'm afraid I get impatient now when people say, well, politicians have got it. I say, look, go and get involved uh, and, and start helping in this situation because in the end, whether a country like this progresses or not is going to depend not on my generation of people, actually, but on your generation of people and getting involved and being prepared never to take no for an answer, but making the country move in the way you want it for the future. Thank you. That's All right. you. Thank you. So uh, in our remaining minutes, what I'd like to do is uh, go around the panel, uh, try to be brief. You know, what's your one minute, two minute uh, takeaway from what you've heard and one last thought for the for the audience, if you don't mind. April, uh, April can I start with you, please? Wow. Um, sure, of course. So I've um, really enjoyed the conversation. I'm finding it's, it's interesting to note that we've actually, this whole notion of um, there's no, well, are these new ideas? Are these big ideas? They're sort of germane ideas where we're, in a way, reading between the lines, but we're also trying to project into the future. Um, I've noticed a lot of synergies between the different things that we're pulling out. And I tend to be one of those people that tries to take a really big picture view, scale out, look at the big picture lens, and what are some of the linkages that I found. And, you know, Mr. Abed, your, your point, and we didn't dive too deep into it, but I'm really intrigued about the notion of um, investing in e-education and making that potentially, I'll be a little provocative here, a sort of fundamental human right for every member of your nation including the poorest of the poor, which then in turn can, to the question over here, lead to um, leveling the play playing field around access to education, access to information, and then obviously to jobs creation. So what does that look like? Because I'm starting to believe that one of the most fundamental investments that any government anywhere on the economic pyramid can make is in technology and sort of not just open data infrastructure, but access to technology, because that opens up a world of possibilities. And then that technology, in turn, not selfishly, but back to the collaborative piece, when I talk about collaborative consumption, this is something that wasn't possible without the internet. I mean, we've had sharing circles and community-based things all the time, but we're now talking about you can share pretty much anything anywhere in the world, from cars and bikes, but to surfboards, and um, you can show your pets online. You can. It's crazy, and so, but then that then turns, becomes this I've dog. I've a whole lot of thoughts going <laughs> on. <laughs> Dogvacay.com. Um, and we, there yeah, was. No, it was the other things I was thinking. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, we can have, I've had many spirited conversations around where you draw the line for what you do and don't share. Um, <laughs> but in fact, and, and there is, I'll just put this out there as a public resource, um, a global directory of companies on collaborativeconsumption.com where if you want to learn about a vertical, a country, like what is happening, but this becomes a virtuous cycle in which you invest in education, it turns into enterprise, then in turn those entrepreneurs end up being able to create new businesses and, and engage in governments. And I think too there's this 
redefinition of what government looks like down the road, which is something very different than today, and I would say in some ways lighter weight. I think if you actually enable, largely again through technology platforms, um, if you enable certain community members to take an active role in their government, but not big G government, mm. small G, there's, and they want to contribute, they want to participate. So we look at, in the case of sharing in the public sector, what would it mean to implement um, collaborative consumption principles in cases of disaster relief and emergency planning? What would it mean for um, you know, neighborhood connectivity, education, et cetera, et cetera? So I know I only have a minute, but these are some of the threads that I've been weaving as we've been talking over this last hour. Thank you. You bet. I do, you got a final point for the, for the group? Yeah, I think my final point was triggered actually by a question from Ms. Khan from Bangladesh about why is tomorrow's technology only implemented day after tomorrow? Why do things take so long to do? And I think it's because it comes back to effectiveness that, that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Blair. And that effectiveness is not just in government, it's in companies as well. You know, Leaders come to the top and they expect that they'll be able to change things, but there's a whole layer people in government and in companies that are there to stop that change happening. They don't like that change. And the way to get that done is to break through that layer and make sure that we have the systems and the processes and the methodologies to make sure that we're effective in implementing what we want to implement. You know? it's, it's, it's just like in government. So many business leaders get appointed CEOs and they think, right, now I'll issue a declaration and, and everyone will jump. And of course, that doesn't happen. And I think a great example of someone who's, of a place that, where that's happened is, is my adopted country now in Singapore. You know, it was, Singapore was nowhere 50 years ago. Right? And it didn't necessarily start off with great democratic government and great transparent government, but it started off with very effective government. And that government was dedicated to doing the right thing by, and to making sure it was implemented. And that spirit is still there. You know, Singapore is now one of the world's richest countries, but they're still not satisfied. And there was a recent survey done on which people are happiest in the world, and Singaporeans came near the bottom. Really? Yeah. And the reason for that is it's, they asked the wrong question. They didn't say, are you satisfied? They said, are you happy? Right? <laughs> and the highest praise you can earn in Singapore for something is not bad. Right? If, you, if, someone's, you know, if you say, how's the food? The guy says, not bad. That means it's really fantastic. <laughs> so, they're, so they're never satisfied. They always believe there's something they better. they got that from the British, <laughs> <laughs> I was so, that was the colonial hangover, I think. <laughs> and now the government's going through a whole new process on how to take their productivity to the next generation. So it's make sure you're able to effectively implement stuff and never be satisfied with what you have. And I think that's the way to get things done. Thank you. Abed? I just um, wanted to say one more thing about uh, women's role in society. Um, I had... Um, started work in almost 40 years ago, but found that most traditional societies, women manage poverty in poor societies. So we thought that if they could manage poverty, they might, should be able to manage development also. So we focused our total, entire um, focus was on women's development. So microfinance program that we have is 100% women-centered microfinance. So, so women's role is in, in societies has, has to become a focus of attention for most societies. Um, so that's one comment. The other comment was um, about being effectively implementing programs that Mr. Blair brought out. Effective implementation is, is, and effective delivery of programs is so important that most programs don't seem to put in enough energy into effectiveness of their out, outcome of their programs. So I think this is something that we need to need to put in place. It's not just program being implemented, but how to do it more effectively. And, and I could give lot, lots of different answers uh, answers to how effectiveness is uh, is created within programs. Uh, so so this is something that we need to understand. I take from this um, this session. Uh, a lot of knowledge <laughs> from various people who talked about it, effectiveness from Mr. Blair, uh, collaborative consumption, and of course, smart cities. I've learned many things. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Nakasan? Yes, in this session, we 
discuss the big idea. The big idea is really needed just to solve the problem, solve the problem. So uh, in case we discuss a big idea, we have to identify what's the problem to be solved, first of all. Uh, still, this is uh, not easy. The problem, the existing problem to be solved varies among the countries, also different. Uh, in some cases, it's good, but in some cases, it's not good, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, especially in the field of politics, uh, we have a tendency, uh, Prime Minister knows quite well, we focus the policy to help, help. But yes, uh, policy to help is uh, needed, but mo much more important is policy to solve. In this regard, policy to, from policy to help to policy to solve. This is the important keyword in, in, when we discuss the uh, big idea. In this regard, today, as I mentioned, yeah, uh, making use of the big idea in the private sector in the policy uh, field is very important. Uh, today, we have a lot of uh, uh, idea from the private sector and also public sector, uh, so private public partnership. And very finally, I'd like to uh, stress the importance of the intellectual exchange among the region. This morning, I heard in this country, Myanmar, uh, the government established the Research Institute. Uh, it, this is a very, very uh, a great advances, uh, I believe. And so, uh, in order to enhance the intellectual exchange, uh, so in this kind of effort, another round of new uh, big idea will emerge. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? I just want to um, echo um, April's uh, previous idea on how technology gives access to everyone and how it opens the world of opportunities, because I think sum up everything that uh, I have learned in this section. Um, I think technology is inclusive. We don't talk about you know, just technology for women, technology for men. We talk about technology for everyone. And I think it really helps to solve all the problems we are talking about now. I think one day, in a very near future, I think all the poor people will be equipped with a small smart tablet and that basically solves a lot of problems. That gives them access to the best education in the world and I'm very, very, um, I have a very strong belief in that. And we discussed that in, in a, a previous uh, sections as well. So yes, I think technology is the key, the young force is the key and we do need help and we do need to learn from all of your expertise around the world. So. Thank you, Hong. Yes, yeah, so I learned masses too, so I'm, <laughs> I'm very pleased with that, but I've just, there's one thing I just want to ask, which is, right, so there are 33, there are, there are 33 institutions that have survived since the 16th century, 29 universities, right? Two um, churches. Two churches, one parliament, I think we know possibly. No, it's an right? Icelandic parliament, mind you. Right? Icelandic parliament. Icelandic parliament, damn, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I think we are one. one well, business. it wasn't quite a fair one, though, I agree. One business. And that's what I want to ask. What is the business? It's a Hudson Bay Company. It still survives in Canada. The what? Hudson, Hudson Bay, Bay Company. Bay Company. That's <laughs> <laughs> you see, the important thing is to learn something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it's a piece of information that will be of no practical utility for the rest of my life. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to close with one uh, thought to leave you with that's a, that's a nice thought. We talked about the big ideas. We talked that what's really important is to figure out the how-to. How to get government, society, and business to work together to implement these ideas. But just think, just think for a minute. In the last 20 seconds, what can be done? Individual responsibility can be achieved. Social e equity. Prosperity for the hardworking, economic growth, business productivity, skilled workers that match needs, reliable infrastructure, stable public policy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Please give an applause to the panel. Enjoy yourself. <laughs>